the image of Neanderthals has often been shaped by narratives of unintelligence, unsophisticated hominins eking out a marginal existence in Ice Age Europe. Yet, as the weight of archaeological evidence continues to grow, a far more complex and sophisticated portrait of these ancient humans emerges. Nowhere is this more evident than in the remarkable discoveries surrounding Neanderthal use of fire-hardened tools, throwing sticks, and their advanced arboreal knowledge. These behaviours aren't just side notes. They're windows into the minds, cultures, and evolutionary pressures that shaped Neanderthals. If Neanderthals engaged in behaviours like making advanced tools, doesn't that suggest a cognitive capacity that's as fundamental to their identity as their bone structure? The ability to create tools is a hallmark of advanced hominid evolution, rooted in their shared biology with modern humans. From the dense forests of Italy to the open woodlands of Germany, the period between 195,000 and 135,000 years ago stands as a defining era in the technological and cognitive advancements of Neanderthals, long before significant interbreeding with Homo sapiens began to alter their genetic landscape. But what exactly did these tools reveal about their intelligence, hunting strategies, and deep connection to their environment? This evidence, along with other archaeological sites across Italy and Germany, reveals a curious species that was deeply attuned to the natural world, employing sophisticated woodworking techniques that challenged earlier assumptions about their capabilities. One of the most compelling aspects of this period is the discovery of wooden tools that were hardened by fire, a technique requiring precise control over heat and an understanding of material properties. Unlike crude implements often associated with early hominins, these fire-treated tools show signs of intentional craftsmanship, designed for durability and function. Fire hardening, a technique widely recognized in later cultures, involves exposing wood to controlled heat to remove moisture, increase strength, and make it more resistant to breakage. The Schöningen spears from Germany are often cited as the earliest known examples of wooden hunting weapons. However, discoveries from what is called the penultimate glacial period between 195,000 and 135,000 years ago indicate that Neanderthals were not merely inheritors of this tradition but innovators in their own right. In Italy, wooden tools have been found alongside faunal remains that suggest systematic hunting strategies where fire-hardened spears were used in close-range thrusting maneuvers to take down large prey. The level of precision required to create and wield such weapons hints at a cognitive sophistication comparable to early Homo sapiens. Beyond fire-hardened spears, another remarkable technological adaptation seen in Neanderthal sites from this period is the use of throwing sticks. These curved wooden tools, sometimes referred to as rabbit sticks or boomerangs, were aerodynamically designed to be hurled at prey particularly smaller game that would have been difficult to catch through direct pursuit, including rabbits and birds. The discovery of such tools in Germany and Italy suggests that Neanderthals understood not only the principles of aerodynamics, but also the importance of diversifying their hunting strategies. The ability to effectively use throwing sticks also points to the development of fine motor skills, hand-eye coordination and planning, all cognitive abilities that reinforce the argument that Neanderthals were far from primitive. In Italy, these throwing sticks were made with you, and may have been a multi-purpose tool also used for digging up tubers. What truly elevates the discussion of Neanderthal ingenuity is the realization that these tools were part of a broader adaptation to arboreal and forested environments. Neanderthals are typically associated with rugged terrain and open steppe landscapes, but evidence from Italy and Germany suggests they also thrived in densely forested regions, where climbing trees and navigating complex canopies would have been necessary skills. But why would Neanderthals have needed arboreal knowledge, and what does it tell us about their broader survival strategies? In Italy's prehistoric woodlands, games such as red deer, wild boar, and even primates in earlier epochs would have required Neanderthals to develop a keen understanding of vertical movement. Climbing trees to survey hunting grounds, set ambushes or escape predators would have been crucial survival tactics. 
Similarly, the use of throwing sticks could be linked to arboreal hunting techniques, where Neanderthals could launch these projectiles from elevated positions, taking advantage of gravity and surprise to increase their chances of a successful hunt. Studies of Neanderthal shoulder morphology indicate that they retained a degree of rotational mobility akin to tree-dwelling primates, further supporting the idea that they were adept at manoeuvring in three-dimensional landscapes. The site of Altamira, most famous for an unfortunate Neanderthal fellow who apparently fell into a cave shaft and became trapped around 170,000 years ago. For a recent investigation, scientists inserted a videoscope into the skull's mouth and calculated, based on tooth wear, that the Altamura man was a younger adult when he died. Overall, he had poor dental health and had lost at least two teeth throughout his lifetime, which was unusual for Neanderthals, who appear to have had mostly healthy teeth. Despite the fact that the skeleton is still buried in the cave, it is the most complete Neanderthal fossil discovered to date. A new study sought to digitally rebuild the cranium, which had both modern, in Neanderthal terminology, and archaic traits, placing it at odds even with this time period. The Altamura man represents the remnant of an archaic population, which was probably not in simple continuity with the Neanderthal lineage, according to the paper. Now shift your gaze north to Germany. Here, during this time, the landscape morphed into a patchwork of woods and steppe, a lake shimmering at its heart. Here, wooden spears, eight of them, rise from the sediments like relics of a lost craft. Think about that. Long before the rise of Homo sapiens, Neanderthals were creating finely crafted throwing spears, not just crude stabbing spears. It wasn't so long ago that archaeologists thought this was a modern invention. Indeed, these aren't mere stabbing sticks. They're balanced, tapered projectile weapons, their bases broad and their tips fire-hardened, sanded and carved from the Norway spruce with a care that staggers the mind. Horse bones, butchered by the dozens, litter the site, their ribs and skulls butchered with precision. The archaeological evidence from Germany underscores this interpretation. Wooden implements found in these areas, combined with evidence of controlled fire use and strategic butchery, reveal an adaptive intelligence that went beyond mere survival. At Schoningen, spears carved with precision from carefully chosen Norway spruce reveal an advanced arboreal knowledge that speaks to a deep intelligence. Indeed, the Schoningen spears elevate this intelligence to a new plane. These weapons stunned archaeologists with their sophistication. Balanced like modern javelins, their centre of gravity a third from the base, ideal for throwing, the Norway spruce grows up to elevations of about 2,000 to 2,500 metres, roughly 6,500 to 8,000 feet, above sea level. Analysing the wood under a microscope, the wood's tight, narrow rings reveal slow growth from these higher elevations. Norway spruce, closely related to the Siberian spruce, grows slow in high elevations, half a millimetre a year or less, its dense, elastic fibres forged by cold winds and thin soils. A tree one and a half inches thick at the base and ten feet tall might have taken forty to sixty years to reach that size. Why did they choose Norway spruce over pine or birch? Its strength and resilience, hard yet flexible, could pierce horsehide without snapping, a quality the trees achieved by decades of slow growth. Indeed, the care in selection boggles the mind. These trees weren't grabbed from the nearest stand of trees. They were sought out, tested, felled, then meticulously shaped. The thickest end, near the root, became the base, tapering naturally to a point, some tips charred to harden them further. This wasn't dumb luck, it was knowledge, passed down through generations. Imagine a Neanderthal hiking miles up a steep mountain to find the perfect tree, then bending a spruce, bending it to test its strength, testing scores before nodding in approval. The eight surviving spears range in length from around 2 metres to 2.5 metres, roughly 6.5 to over 8 feet, with diameters between 30 and 50 millimetres between 1 and 2 inches. The replica throwing spears, designed to match the original dimensions and balance, typically weigh between 0.7 to 1 kilogram, roughly 1.5 to 2.2 pounds, for the throwing spears, remarkably similar to modern javelins. Thrusting spears would be heavier due to their sturdier build and greater diameter. The lightweight design made them extremely practical, 
whether thrown or thrust. Their balance was key, with the centre of gravity carefully positioned for effective use. The spear's balance suggests these early humans understood weight distribution, an engineer's instinct in a hunter's soul. Schuningen's spear technology was laser-sharp, a specialisation born of need and generations of trial and error. Another spear point found at Clacton-on-the-Sea was also made of yew, due to the lack of high-elevation trees in that region. This advanced arboreal wisdom ties these sites together. These humans could read their woodlands like a book, spruce for strength, oak for fuel, hazel for flexibility. How did they learn this? Through years of watching trees grow, testing their give, and remembering what worked. These sites show this level of intelligence started much earlier than the crow magnons. These Neanderthals were not passively reacting to their environment. They were actively shaping it to their advantage. The fire-hardening process used on wooden spears would have required an understanding of how different types of wood reacted to heat, indicating not just skill, but also experimentation and refinement over generations. Could it be that Neanderthals had a system of knowledge transmission that allowed them to pass down these techniques? One of the most fascinating discoveries related to Neanderthal tool use is the application of pine tar for hafting stone points to wooden shafts. Pine tar, derived from the slow burning of resinous wood in oxygen-restricted environments, is an early form of adhesive technology that required complex knowledge of fire control and material science. Neanderthals at sites such as Campitello in Italy have left behind traces of this adhesive, showing that they were capable of creating composite tools, an innovation that greatly improved hunting efficiency. By attaching sharp stone points to wooden handles, Neanderthals could fashion more durable and lethal weapons, allowing them to take down larger prey with greater precision. The process of making pine tar involved heating resinous wood at a controlled temperature, collecting the sticky substance and carefully applying it to stone and wood surfaces. This technology underscores not only their ingenuity but also their ability to plan and execute multi-step procedures, a hallmark of advanced cognition. One of the most intriguing aspects of Neanderthal culture during this period is the evidence of social learning and instruction. Unlike simple trial-and-error behaviours seen in some non-human primates, Neanderthals would have engaged in teaching and apprenticeship, where younger members of the group learned from experienced hunters and toolmakers. This form of knowledge transmission suggests that Neanderthal communities had a cultural continuity that was not unlike that of early Homo sapiens. The ability to produce fire-hardened tools and throwing sticks required foresight, patience and skill traits that would have been honed through generational teaching. Moreover, the strategic use of such tools may have contributed to the success of Neanderthals in an era when competition for resources was becoming increasingly intense. Between 170,000 and 120,000 years ago, Neanderthals faced climatic fluctuations that altered their landscapes and forced them to innovate. The mastery of fire not only provided warmth and protection, but also enhanced their ability to process wood for tools and weaponry. The combined use of fire-hardened spears for close-range thrusting and throwing sticks for ranged attacks provided them with a diversified arsenal that could adapt to different prey and hunting conditions. Yet despite their ingenuity, Neanderthals would soon face one of the greatest challenges in their history, the arrival of Homo sapiens. It was after 120,000 years ago that significant interbreeding between these two species began, altering the genetic and cultural trajectory of Neanderthal populations. But before this interbreeding reshaped their legacy, the Neanderthals of Italy stood at the height of their technological and cognitive prowess. They were hunters, craftsmen and innovators who had learned to harness fire, master aerodynamics and navigate their environment with a level of sophistication that defies outdated stereotypes. If we strip away the biases that have long coloured our perceptions of Neanderthals, what remains is a vision of a people who were not so different from ourselves. They were problem solvers, strategists and survivors who left behind a legacy that continues to challenge and inspire modern anthropology. In their fire-hardened tools, their aerodynamic weapons, and their advanced arboreal knowledge, 
we see the hallmarks of intelligence and adaptation, traits that in many ways define what it means to be human. The question that remains is not whether Neanderthals were capable of such advancements, but rather how much more remains to be discovered about their remarkable world. Whether we call them Neanderthals or Neanderthals, this ancient human was a fire-wielding, spear-throwing, woodworking human who knew how to attach stone spearheads to sticks, the first compound tools made by man. Since they were engaging in complex behaviours, doesn't that suggest a shared cognitive and social framework with modern humans? Ponder on that for a moment and also please share and comment and subscribe. Thank you for watching.